All right, well, let's take our Bibles this evening, if you would, and turn to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. <clears throat> we'll pick up where we left off last time, and we're going to pick up in verse number 14. And uh, as you turn there in Romans 9, verse number 14, uh, we must be reminded of Romans chapter number 8, because Romans 9, 10, and 11 uh, builds upon uh, the foundation that's been laid in Romans chapter number 8. And um, will we begin with um, what uh, Stephen said this evening, that uh, the suffering of this present time, that's what he says in Romans 8, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And the idea of being revealed, understand, is it's already done. We will be glorified in Christ. But it hasn't been manifested yet. It would be as uh, back then you would go to the theater and you would see the veil that would uh, keep people from seeing what was on the stage and behind that veil the stage was already set the people were there ready to be revealed all that had to happen was for the curtain to be rolled away and in the same way in the mind of God our glorification has already taken place but it hasn't been revealed yet and he speaks of the suffering of this present time and these are things that are very real and we talked about in Romans chapter 8 how we understand that the suffering in this world are both on the just and on the unjust. The sufferings that we see is because of sin, because we live in a sin-cursed world. But for the Christian, there's something that is different for us, and that's why he says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now that word purpose is important because we see that word appear again in Romans chapter number 9. And he says then in verse 29 of Romans 8, he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, notice, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, that's Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is the purpose of God for us, that we would be conformed to the image of His Son, and one day we will be fully glorified in Him. And then when that happens, notice the second part is, that He, that's Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so understand that Christ will be glorified when we will be glorified with Him. It all began in Him. And He says in verse 30, Moreover whom He did foreknow, uh, more for whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified now notice the tense here is it's already happened now we understand we are not right now in our perfect bodies right now we live in a sin cursed world where we see suffering we see death we see disease uh, a lot of sickness going around and so we understand that the world that we live in and we understand that uh, because of what we have in Christ, all that goes on in the world is not worthy. It, 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 uh, Paul does not make light of the suffering. He does not say, get over the suffering. He just says that the glory that is to come is our far greater weight than the present suffering. And so with that being said, here is the question for us. Well, wait a minute. God had promises for Israel. And we know that now Israel has rejected Christ as a whole, as a nation. So, wait a minute, has God failed in Israel? Well, he goes on in chapter 9 to answer that question. He says in verse 6, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Uh, so understand here that as we think about the great promises that he received, and he ends Romans 8 uh, by saying that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Now, how do, what do we base that on? Now, God's word is enough if what he says, uh, because it comes from him, we can hold it and say it is the truth. But here the Apostle Paul is going to back that up with the testimony of history as recorded in the Word of God and how God has dealt with His people throughout the centuries. And he presents the case to them that God has not failed. His Word has not failed. His purpose has not failed. And so we come to chapter 9 in consideration of what has been revealed in Romans chapter number 8. And I think it is a mistake that often people do when they kind of break up the, the certain books and they 
kind of put in parenthesis Romans 9, 10, 11 as if it has nothing to do with the rest of the book of Romans, but it has everything to do with the rest of the book of Romans. It is actually vital for us to gain an understanding. So we are in light of the coming glory which will be manifested in Christ. We deal with present suffering and we know that God is faithful. Now I want you to notice some of the words, uh, the phrasing that we find in Romans 9, just to show us the emphasis in Romans 9 verse 6. He says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Notice in verse 9 he says, for this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Notice he's talking about the word of God that he spoke to Sarah. The word of promise. Verse 11 he says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Notice the expression, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Notice verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same Purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that, that, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Notice verse uh, number 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And so notice here, there's an emphasis on what God is doing, what God has done, and it is a confirmation based upon the testimony of history, based upon what God has done. As we see that his word has not failed, it is a testimony to us that his word cannot fail today. That He will do His work. That His purpose will be fulfilled in us as His purpose has been fulfilled throughout the pages of human history. Now let's read our text after all this. Let's read our text this evening. And we come to verse 14 and we continue and He says this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that by my name might be declared that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, and the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory unto the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now it's important here to consider that often people come to the Romans 9, 10, and 11 and say, this is an answer to the Jewish questions, but it is not. This is an answer to the Gentiles. <laughs> uh, and uh, in an understanding of how God has dealt with Israel, who is he writing to? He's writing to the church at Rome. He's writing to a group of Gentiles. We see that according to Romans chapter number 15, he, he uh, plainly states that he's writing to them as Gentiles. And so understand, he takes the truth that he's just expounded and he relates that to the Gentiles. And he invites both, notice, even whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. But I want to draw your attention, if you would, to verse number 22, and note what the Bible says. The Bible says this, What if God, willing to show his wrath, notice the next sentence, and to make his power known. I want to preach this evening on this. To make his power known. 
we find in our text that that is part of the purpose of God. As we look at the testimony of history, to make His power known. He said that earlier, if you notice in our text in verse 17, He says, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. And so, we find that one of the purposes of God is to make His power known. I want us to consider, first of all, as we come to our text, the contention with God's plan. The contention with God's plan. The contention with God's plan is twofold, as we see in our text, and we identify those contentions by the questions that are being asked. And the Apostle Paul, obviously, is the one asking those questions, uh, and he also answers those questions. The first one seems to be that God is unjust as we consider the present show of mercy upon the one and not the other. And this is based upon the, the verses before verse 14 that we read. Notice how uh, what the Bible says in verse number 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Verse 12 says, and it was said unto her, that's to Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. And so we stop and here comes the question. As God in his uh, foreknowledge and in his wisdom uh, chose to have Jacob be the one who would be the representative and the lineage of Christ and Esau would be uh, placed to the side. We understand what we say. Well, I, I, the question is this. Is God unjust to show favor towards one and not the other? Now that, we would say, seems to be a valid question. The second contention is that found in the question that are asked in verse number 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And so the second contention is that man cannot be blamed for his actions if God shows mercy to the one and not the other. Can then man be blamed? And so those would be the questions that would arise that the Apostle Paul is seeking to put to rest uh, to, in this contention as he's just declared that God, in His infinite wisdom, uh, because His Word is not going to fail, had appointed a promised seed in Abraham who would be traced in Isaac and Jacob. And that's why Ishmael was rejected. That's why Esau was rejected. They were not part of the line of Christ despite the desire of Abraham to make Ishmael the seed, and despite the desire of Isaac to make Esau the seed. God's plan came through. That's why God told Abraham, not Ishmael, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Why? So that the purpose of God might stand. Now, the contention, consider for the first one, is first of all, the place of, of God as sovereign. The place of God as sovereign. The question that is presented in verse 14 is this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Now the direct answer is, God forbid. No. Absolutely not. It is a direct answer. God is not unrighteous. As a matter of fact, we've learned since Romans 1 that we are dealing with a righteous God. He is the righteous God. It is one of His great titles. Uh, and if we go back, let's turn, if you would, with me to Romans chapter number 2 because uh, some truth has already been established concerning God. In Romans 2, notice verse number 1. The Apostle Paul here, at the beginning of the Gospel of Romans in the few first chapters, he tries to explain that both the Jew and the Gentiles, that they are all under sin and they are all under the righteous judgment of God. Notice verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, the judgment of God is according to what? Truth. That means He is a righteous God. He is a righteous judge. Verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent in heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment 
judgment of God, who will render to, notice, every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. God is not unrighteous. When it comes here, he's dealing with Salvation. He is dealing with the justice and the judgment of God. His wrath upon sin, unrighteousness, wrath, tribulation, indignation. And so we understand it's already been clearly laid out in Romans that God is a righteous God. He deals according to truth. He is not unjust. And so in the matter of salvation and the judgment of God is not a respecter of persons, but as it pertains to the matter of God's plan in this world, God exercises perfect wisdom in His dealing with man. In other words, there is therefore no unrighteousness with God. And so, the direct question is this. Well, wait a minute. God, why would God select Jacob and not Esau? Because... If God had just followed the flow of man, Esau, who was the firstborn, was the rightful heir of the blessing. And God says that was not his plan. Abraham, whose son, whose firstborn son was Ishmael, God rejected that. And by the way, we know and understand that that was the work of the flesh. Why? Because God said to Abraham, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so we understand that we are dealing with, we know that God is a righteous God. And we also have to understand that as men, we are finite. We do not understand everything. We must be conscious that God sees everything. The past, the present, and the future at the same time. And the, the affairs of men have been perfectly orchestrated by a sovereign God. You see, before Esau was born, God knew in His foreknowledge that Esau would despise his birthright. Before Ishmael was born, God knew that he would be a man of the flesh. And so we have to understand that God is not unrighteous. We look at the things in their present state. We look at that selection in its present state. We say, Esau, Jacob, God chose Jacob. It's unrighteous. No, it's not unrighteous because we do not know what God knows. We do not have the infinite wisdom that God has. There is no unrighteousness with God. And so we see the place of God as sovereign, but number two, we see the place of man as clay. He goes on in verse number 19, and, and so I'm dealing first of all with the question, the contentions here, and he says this, Thou wilt say that unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the powder power over the clay and the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, the Apostle Paul, and by the way, throughout this text, there is a multitude of reference to the Old Testament. And in this particular passage here, those questions are really questions that come from the book of Isaiah. And if we turn with me to Isaiah chapter 45, let's turn back to Isaiah we must understand that as we look at those references, we began Romans chapter number 9 by understanding that God gave Israel a special place. Uh, they received the promises, the covenants. And we know the greatest thing that received it, that is it would be through them that the Messiah would come, Jesus Christ. But we also understand as we study uh, uh, the uh, history of the Jewish people that the Jewish people turned against God. They began to worship false gods and prophet after prophet was sent to the nation, to the northern uh, tribe, the ten tribes and the southern uh, tribe of Judah and Benjamin uh, to proclaim the message of God. And in Isaiah 45 verse 9, notice what the Bible says. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker.'" 
Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe well unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth, and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all of their hosts, have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all of his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my, capti my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, we understand here, he, he declares his great creation of the fact that God is the one who has fashioned all of us. We've been fashioned in the womb. And so understand, as we consider all of our differences and all of our uh, different looks and all those things. It is God that has fashioned man. And so the contention would be, well, wait a minute. If Esau was not chosen and Jacob was chosen to be part of the lineage of Christ and to be part of the promise and heirs of the covenant, how can Esau be held responsible for his sin? We look up and we say, well, why couldn't God make Esau Jacob? Why could God not do that? Uh, but we understand that we are dealing particularly here uh, in this passage of Romans 9 with the purpose of God. The purpose of God as we've been studying in the book of Genesis is the redemption of man. Uh, that is the unfolding drama of redemption throughout the Word of God. It is the message of redemption. It is the message uh, to the world that Jesus Christ saves from sin. That's why Jesus Christ declared Himself. Uh, he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to redeem man from his sin. The Bible says that we see Jesus, He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And so understand, before Christ came, there was a promised seed, and God particularly fashioned men and women for that purpose to be accomplished. I'd like to have, be like that person. I would like to be part of the seed. You know, you, God in his infinite wisdom has not chosen you to be part of the lineage of Christ. And you know what we do? We leave, that to Christ. we leave that to God who is sovereign. And we understand that our place is as clay. Job 9.3, Job declares this in verse 3 and 4. He says, If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? The answer is no. You see, we, a Job could have said, Oh God, you've done this to me. But he says, No, I cannot harden my heart against God. And so we understand the contentions here are, we see the place of God as a sovereign. God is not unrighteous. And the place of man as clay. We accept how God has made us and for what He's made us for. But secondly, we not only see the contention with God's plan, but number two, we see the manifestation of God's purpose. I want you to consider now, if we go back to verse number 14 and continue from that verse, and he says this, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Now, here's the elaborate answer. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, we must also be aware that this is an Old Testament quote. Now, the question is asked then, is there unrighteousness with God? The question comes again because of the election of Isaac instead of Ishmael, and the election of Jacob instead of Esau. As stated in verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. 
And so the first answer to refute the charge of unrighteousness in God's sovereignty is the message that God gave to Moses. Well, where is that message? It's found in Exodus 33. And so let's go there. Exodus 33. The great thing about the Word of God is we, we, we don't have to make up anything. We can just go back to the Bible and give us the answers. <laughs> we don't have to figure out what that means, what Paul wrote in Romans 9. We can find out what that means. Exodus 33, verse... Uh, let's, well, let's pick it up in verse 13. Just We'll get some uh, context there. So, Exodus 33, verse 13. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight... Now, Moses is speaking with God. Show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And so notice here, uh, Moses wants to know God. He wants to find grace in the sight of God. And he wants to, to uh, consider that this nation, the nation of Israel, is God's people. Verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not hence. And so uh, God says, My presence is going to go with you. And Moses says, If your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go anywhere. Verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, uh, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So understand here in the context, Moses is speaking with God and he says, how can we know that we are thy people? And God simply replies and it says, because I will be with you. And Moses agrees. He says, you're right. We don't want to go anywhere unless you are with us. And they acknowledge here, the acknowledgement is that God says, I'm going to be with you to show that I have blessed you over all nations of the earth. I've given you a great favor. I've given you great blessing. And so he finally delivers this truth as he says to Moses, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. In other words, it was the choice of God to select the Jewish people to be His representatives in the world. It was God's choice. And so he says in verse, if we go back to Romans 9, so he quotes, and that, that, that's the context of Exodus 33. It was God declaring His favor upon the Hebrew people. God declaring His special blessing. And by the way, didn't we see His blessing? The uh, children of Israel walked into the promised land. The walls of Jericho came down. That favor was not shown to any other nation. It was shown just to the people of Israel. That was God's choice. And then He says in verse 16, just by way of emphasis, He says this, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. I believe here he could, we could go back to the contention, you remember, between Ishmael and Isaac and between Jacob and Esau. If we remember in Genesis 25, 23, the Lord said to Rebekah, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. And so we understand that during their lifetime, their respective lifetime, uh, Esau never served Jacob. He's talking about the generations to follow, the Edomites and the Israelites. Uh, and uh, again, that would be in the future. And by the way, we know that during their lifetime, actually Esau was more powerful than Jacob. When Jacob, you remember, he was about to cross uh, the river to meet Esau, and Esau had more men with him than Jacob did. So I understand he's talking about prophetically as he's revealing those two nations that are in her womb. But understand, you remember, Isaac wanted Esau to receive the blessing. 
But Rebekah remembered the prophecy and she sent Jacob in. But then there was also a contention in Genesis 17.15, if you remember. Um, God gives the promise to Abraham about you're going to have a child. Your wife is going to bear a child. You're going to call his name Isaac. And Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael would live before thee. And God says, no. Isaac is the promise seed. You're going to call his name. Your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. And you're going to call his name Isaac. And to him will be committed the covenants and the promises and the blessing. And so understand here, he says, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You see, as much as Abraham wanted his firstborn Ishmael to receive that blessing as Isaac did not come in his own timing, he thought, I will, I want that to happen. But that was not God's choice. And the same is with uh, Isaac who wanted Esau to have the blessing. That's what he willed. That's what he wanted. And we understand that God says, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, it doesn't matter what they do, but of God that showeth mercy. He told us a little earlier that even in the mother's room, oh, mother's room of Rebekah, they were not selected because of their works. They were not selected because of anything they had done. They were in the womb. There was no sin in their lives. They were selected based upon the sovereignty of God and His infinite wisdom and knowledge over all things. You see, it is important to understand the purpose of God as described in, their, in this passage. The purpose of God. He goes on to say in verse 17, he says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, and so here comes the second illustration, if you would. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name may, may be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And so notice he re reverts back. He gives a second example and goes back uh, to the truth that was given uh, in the Old Testament. So he speaks of Pharaoh. Now it is important to understand that God, and this is why, let me say, God did not cause Pharaoh to sin. He did not make Pharaoh sin. God is not the author of sin. But he arranged circumstances and events to put this particular man to be in authority at that particular time in order to use his evil to fulfill his will. Now I want to explain that. It's very important. But that's exactly what it was. Psalm 76.10 tells us this. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. How is that possible? How can the evil and the wickedness of the world praise God just as in Pharaoh? The remainder of wrath shall thou the, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. I want us to go back to Exodus chapter number 10 because this statement about Pharaoh is stated back in Exodus. And so notice Exodus chapter number 10. I know we're going back and forth, uh, but I, I think this is important. Well, let me, I know this is important. <laughs> notice Exodus 10, verse 1 and 2. Uh, the, the, the purpose that was stated there in Romans 9 was first stated in Exodus chapter 10. And thou, Lord, said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and thou, that, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. You see, the purpose of God was clear as stated in Romans chapter number 9. God raised Pharaoh up in that particular time so that God could reveal his power in the midst of a man's evil. And so what happened is what happens throughout the scriptures. When man is in a sinful state, God gives him more of what he wants. Uh, for example, Romans chapter number 1, we already saw that. Remember, those who deny God, who deny the existence of God, who refuse to retain God into their knowledge, God gives them over. 
unto a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And we say, how can someone that is in sin become more sinful? Well, God has restraining mechanism in the lives of people. And so understand that God had a particular purpose and that was for His glory to be revealed in Egypt and by raising up Pharaoh and to show that He defeated through the ten plagues a ten of the gods of the Egyptians. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the Bible tells us back and forth that, heart, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God hardened his heart. And he gave Pharaoh over to himself to go and to be even more confident in his evil. So that at the height of man's evil, God would show how he could defeat the most evil of men. And so as we consider... The manifestation of God's purpose, he tells us that in verse 17, he says this, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Notice, here's the purpose, that I might show my power in thee. <laughs> you see that? God would show his power in Pharaoh. Because he stood firm against God. At the height of of wickedness of a man who claimed himself to be God. And he did so to show his power. And notice that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. There it is. What's the purpose of God? For his power to be shown. For his name to be declared in all the earth. And again, there's a pattern in Scripture. You remember, David was called a man after God's own heart because in 1 Samuel 17, as he went out to fight Goliath, he did not go fight Goliath because he thought he could defeat him. He did not go and fight Goliath because he thought he was strong enough. He went to fight Goliath because he believed that God could defeat him and he believed that all the nations of the earth would know that there was a God in Israel. That's why he went. That's what he said. And so understand we are brought back to the purpose of God. God used that. He hardened Pharaoh's heart as, as Pharaoh was already a wicked king. And he uh, continually hard. I think it's mentioned ten times. Continual hardening and hardening. So that the power of God could be revealed. You see the display of his power. God wants man to see his great power. His hardening of Pharaoh's heart resulted in ten powerful plagues as judgments upon the gods of Egypt. And each plague was directed specifically to a god of Egypt. From the sun, from the darkness that was directed to the sun, God. The firstborn of the house of Pharaoh would be the next god in Egypt. All of those plagues were directed at a particular God. And the historians would agree, uh, the majority of them would agree, uh, that uh, during the uh, time of the Israelites, during the time of Moses, that Egypt was at its height. It was at its zenith of its power. And that's when God defeated Egypt. When they had all the confidence in their God, and God with the ten plagues wiped them out. The power of God was manifested and all the world heard about it. All the world heard that there was a God in Israel. But there's one more. Not only do we see the purpose of God is to display His power, to declare His praise, but thirdly, to demonstrate His holiness. Because notice verse 22 says this. <coughs> what if God, willing to show His wrath, <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, and to make His power known, Endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Notice, he showed his wrath. He demonstrates his holiness. You see, the judgment of God is demonstrated against evil, which reveals the holiness of God. His wrath reveals to mankind the divine standard of a holy God. And that is his purpose. So, God, in His infinite wisdom and sovereignty, chose Israel, gave Israel a place of prominence. And we see how God dealt with Israel, but we also see how God dealt even in the affairs of men to show forth His power, to declare His praise, and to demonstrate His holiness for His purpose. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter number 2 and... This is, I believe, the greatest illustration that we can think of 
to illustrate the point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make. In Acts chapter number 2, it's the day of Pentecost, and the Apostle Peter is preaching. Uh, we know that as a result, thousands of, of uh, Jews are going to uh, turn to Christ for salvation. But in Acts chapter number 2, in the middle of his message, I want you to consider what the Apostle Peter says as he confronts those in Jerusalem in verse number 22. He says this, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. Him, that's Christ, the Jesus of Nazareth. Notice, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Notice, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And so understand here, you see as Peter is preaching, what is he saying? He's saying both and the same, that God is sovereign. Uh, when we speak of Jesus Christ, we are speaking of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That was the plan of God. And nothing was going to stop the plan of God. And although the, the, the nations of the world and those who were religious and the Romans, although they thought themselves that they were opposing God, they thought that they were opposing Jesus Christ, and they thought to themselves, we are going to use our power and our wickedness, and they lied, and they deceived, and they cheated, and they mistreated Him. And we look at the wickedness of men, and we look at how evil they were on that day. We look at how they treated our blessed Savior in all the things that they did, and the cursing and the martyr and the crucifixion on the cross and the mocking on the cross we look at all those things and we say oh how vile and wicked man is but the apostle Paul says you don't understand that was predetermined by God God used the wickedness of men for his glory he used the, the depths of wickedness to reveal his power to proclaim the message of the gospel to the world and to show and to reveal his holiness that, might, that sin must be judged. There it is. Men thought they were crucifying Christ in their wicked deeds. But God had already determined it to be done. He used them unbeknownst to them. To accomplish his purpose. I think Joseph greatly encapsulated that statement as he went throughout his life. And then Jacob, his father, passes away. And all the brothers of Joseph are concerned that Joseph is going to retaliate towards them. And this is what he said. He says, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. You see what he says? It was predetermined by God. The mocking, the dungeon, the prison, the false accusation was all evil. But God used it for good. Amen. And you know what happened in the end? The salvation of Israel. They were saved from the famine, the worldwide famine. <laughs> Who are we to question God? Who are we to say, why did he not choose Esau or Jacob? No, God is sovereign. And he's done all things good. To declare his power, his praise, and his holiness. And so we see in our passage the contention with God's plan that perhaps we have in our own mind in, in our finite state. We see the manifestation of God's purpose, but thirdly, and we're done, we see the preparation of the glory. The Bible says in verse 22, if we go back to Romans chapter number 9, and he says this. What if God... Willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. You see, God already knows the end. We cannot see the end, but God sees the end. Do you remember what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28? What is the purpose for us? For us to be conformed to the image of His Son. He talks about in His foreknowledge whom He called, He also justified, whom He justified them, He also glorified. God's final purpose. So here, that promise is brought back as we 
to study this scripture to the truth for us as believers. And so he mentions here by really posing and asking this, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Uh, some people have said, well, what are the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Well, I believe that any time you find God exercising his wrath upon man, it is always done in patience. It is always done, in, as he says here, in long suffering. <coughs> Let me explain you the pattern. Do you remember in the days of Noah? God said that he would strive with man over a hundred years. 120 years before judgment would fall. Uh, do you remember the warnings that were given to the children of Israel as they turned to false gods and became like the heathen nations? God sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Hundreds of years would expire. In the northern kingdom, all 19 kings were evil. And God, through all 19 kings, was long-suffering and merciful and sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And in His long-suffering, those vessels who were really the, the, the people of God uh, were really fitted because of their, uh, their, 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 their wickedness. They were fitted for destruction. But in God's long-suffering... It could be applied to the people of God. It could be applied to the heathen as we see it applied to Pharaoh in this passage. God has made His power known in judgment in Israel, has He not? He has made His power known in judgment of the heathen nations. As the children of Israel defeated many nations in the promised land, but also the nation of Egypt and mighty empires after that. And He says and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. I want you to go with me to Isaiah 13. The prophet Isaiah was sent to preach to Israel If you go with me, notice in verse number 5. Both the Isaiah and Jeremiah were sent to the nation of Israel. And they basically deliver the same message. In Isaiah 13, 5, the Bible says, They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of His indignation to destroy the whole land. Who were the weapons of God's indignation? He the nations. You see, God is an infinite purpose and wisdom. Defeated heathen nations, but He also used heathen nations to judge His own people. In Jeremiah, we see the same, um, uh, the same idea in Jeremiah chapter number 50. In Jeremiah 50, in verse number 25, Jeremiah says, The Lord hath opened His armory and hath brought forth the weapons of His indignation. For this is the work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. So God would use the Chaldeans to exercise His judgment upon Israel. So if we go back to Romans 9, we consider the purpose of God and we know what the purpose of God was for the Jews in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promised. And we know how God worked in that. We also saw how God worked and spoke to Moses himself. And he says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he would reveal to the world that his people would be Israelites. It would also be communicated to the heathen nation that God has power over the heathen nations. We also know that Israel itself, at a particular time, both the nation of Israel, when it was divided in the ten tribes, and the nation of Judah, Judah and Benjamin in the south, were both judged because of their wickedness before the Holy God. And he used heathen nations to do that. And now we come to this place of 
the position of the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews have at that time, the majority have rejected Christ. So what about the Jew? And he tells us very simply that God has showed his wrath in order to make his power known while he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared unto glory even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only but also the Gentiles and so understand that he go, he's going to go on to talk later about that how the Jews now have a veil placed over them one day God is going to bring them back as there's going to be great revival during the tribulation period where they're going to preach the gospel and embrace the Savior Jesus Christ but that's not their state now. But he reminds them that God has orchestrated all the affairs of men to open up to where now the Jews are not the only representatives of God. In truth, the ones who are the representative of God are those who now have been shown favor by God Himself. The local New Testament church, which is comprised both of the Jews and the Gentiles. That is the purpose of God. He's orchestrated those things. He's ordained those things. Those things have not taken him by surprise. He's going to call later, but I'll just uh, mention now. That's a warning for us. To make sure that we are in a place that God wants us to be as his representative because he has shown mercy to us. And we must not take that for granted that Israel did. And he's going to go on and talk about that. How we must not be like Israel. And that is a warning for us. And may the Lord, may the Lord help us here. Because all of this is, this is for this. To make his power known. That's why he has done all that. To make his power known. On the cross of Calvary. Those who crucified Christ. The religious leaders who falsely brought false witnesses against him. They thought they had schemed their way to the death of Christ. They thought they had won. They thought they defeated Christ and done away with the followers of Christ. But then Peter preaches to those same men and says, You with wicked hands, you took him and you crucified him. But I want you to know that God had already predetermined for that to be done. And God is an infinite wisdom. Used even your wickedness to accomplish His great purpose. You know what that reminds us of? We are just finite people. God is a great and sovereign God whose plan and purpose cannot be thwarted. And one day, you know what that means for us, according to Romans 8.28? One day, we will be like Him. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. In this world, in the past, present, or the future. And so, I rejoice at the end of verse number 12 already. We know that's where we're going, but he says what he says in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been His counselor? Or who hath first given to Him, and it shall be recompensed unto Him again? For of Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You see, the sovereign God of heaven has shown his favor toward us. And what a great privilege for us to have the favor of God.